and Ed Cans and Josh Clement join us now. Welcome, nice to see you both. Hi, Thank you, Tim. So you're kicking off the second season of your web series, Curiously Adirondack. We are, we're on a roll. <laughs> I guess much like TV shows, when you get word that uh, you've been picked up for a second season, that, that must be a great feeling and, and a great sense of satisfaction. Well, well sure, when any, any time that uh, your audience says we want some more of this, that, that's a positive, for sure. Now, Ed, you're, this is really all based on your newspaper column, and this uh, you've been writing that for almost 25 years, or more than 25 yeah, years, yeah, haven't you? Yeah, almost 30 years. All yeah, well, that sort of got me working with Josh on the, on the podcast, on the podcast that and we and How did. many years ago was that now that the podcast started? Well, we have put out 120 podcasts. We haven't yeah, missed so a Friday over two years. with Incredible. original content, so uh, two and a half years. So when Josh first approached you with the idea of, of taking a lot of your stories, and you're a great storyteller, and, and doing the podcast, what, uh, what did you think? Did you think that this was a, a great idea, a great way to maybe reach a, a whole new audience? Uh, it was. I've always wanted to reach out to, uh, to, to this station, actually, particularly since I live just down the road and, and, and try my hand in and, and new media. As a writer, has been writing for a long time. It's fun to, to find new audiences. And, being an old dog, it's good to learn new tricks along the way. And, and uh, when I met Josh, I thought he's just the guy to get involved with professionally because the quality of his work is so high. So uh, we got started, and, and then, then doing the audio stuff led to the idea that why don't we do video, which is really Josh's strong suit and was totally new territory for me. So we took the plunge and made a couple of videos and got, got rolling, and they clicked, and, and here we are. Off and running. So the the podcast went so well. Uh, 120 of those, as you mentioned, Josh. You knew along the way you were producing a few videos along the way to, in addition to the podcast. But then you thought, what a what a great web series this would make. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, I think that you and I, you had called me one day and and told me about the salamander thing that goes on in the Adirondacks, and that sort of got us off and running. Yeah, that was our first one. And um, I mean, that was like, I mean, he, he literally said, you know, I might call you at midnight because these things come out at a certain time. And I think that's what happened. I think, yeah. he, and uh, that, that's why that one's a little dark, but uh, but uh, that that's what got us started. And then, you know, that the dialogue was, was going then. And then the audio, I think you had thought for years that this column that you write would would maybe make a nice audio piece. Audio thing, yeah. Uh, yeah. Radio, I don't know if that's from listening to the radio or on your part, other pieces that are like that. Yeah, yeah, you hear other things like that, and I always thought, well, my stuff is just as good as everybody <laughs> else's, so that's that's the way we get into yeah, these things. Yeah, and, and in, in some ways, um, maybe almost unique, because you do it from the perspective of the Adirondacks. Obviously, there's other podcasts that look at nature and in other parts of the country, but the great thing here is that uh, it focuses on life in the Adirondacks, and not just the wildlife, but people living in this right. big six million acre park. Yeah, one of the reasons we're having so much fun and why Josh and I, I think, have clicked on, on, on the, the, these, th these projects of ours is uh, we both have high standards of, of quality and we work hard and we'll put in the hours to make it right, but at the same time, we, we approach it with a light spirit and we're open to the spontaneous things that happen along the way, and we like a good laugh now and then. And so there's a, uh, even in the, the, the straighter pieces, there's always an undertone of, of humor and playfulness, and, and that makes it fun for me to do, and I think it does for Josh, too. Even in the title, like your segment on, on, on the famous people buried in cemeteries, uh, Asleep Under the Sod was, yeah. the, was the title of this segment, which was, which was fantastic. You mentioned, so the first one you shot was the salamanders, that, that time in the spring where nature calls and yeah. they go looking for their mates and, and you have them crawling across roads and just about everywhere uh, in the spring when you get that, that first rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that must have been wild to, to try to shoot. To, to have them crawling all over the place. Oh, absolutely, and I, I, I've been here my whole life, and I've heard of salamanders, and I've seen them from time to time in the woods, but you know, he tells me, well, wait a second, these things come out, and they cross the road, and this, you, you, you know, he pointed out, there, this is now an opportunity where you will be able to capture these things. You know, and, and I always saw the red Fs, mm -hmm. you know, on a hike or something like mm -hmm. that, but these are the, you know, the big with the beautiful yellow spots, yeah. and uh, if you have a camera ready, I mean, visually, it's, it's stunning, really. And it's a once a year thing. They're out a couple of nights in the spring, and then if you miss it, you gotta wait another year. 
and a symphony. Uh, the sounds are incredible as well, not just the sight of them, uh, but to hear all those amphibians and creatures. Uh, yeah, the frog chorus yeah. in the background is great. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah, it's fun. So you decided to do eight s segments for the first year. And really, you, like you said, Ed, you really cover quite a bit. Some of them are very humorous. Others really provide glimpses into history that a lot of us maybe haven't heard before. You did one on this hotel mm -hmm. um, that really was, in its day, the resort in the Adirondacks because it was strategically placed, uh, Bartlett's Hotel, and, and people d just uh, uh, would use this hotel. And I, I think for a lot of people, they may not have ever heard of the place. No, no, it was fairly obscure. It was gone by the late 1880s. Yeah. But it was a beloved place. Uh, I got int interested in that place years ago doing a magazine piece on the old hotels on the Saranacs. And a lot of these places were really fancy and grand, and they were a big deal. But I never really got a sense that anybody really liked them all that much. I mean, they were s somewhat commercially successful. Mm. But anything I read about this place, Bartlett's, was people just loved it. And, uh, and it was quirky. It fit right into our sort of quirky uh, theme of, of Curious the Adirondack. The, the people that ran it were sort of a little bit different. They had a menagerie of wild animals there, mm -hmm. so when you stayed at Bartlett, you had to ride by boat. A pet otter might bound out to greet you, and they had a pet deer and a raccoon, and, uh, and there was a pet parrot that lived in the hotel, and, and every night in the evening, late in the evening, the parrot would say, good night, Mrs. Bartlett. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't make stuff like yeah. that up. Yeah, it was just great, so we really wanted to do a piece. And, and, and I happen to know Fran Yardley, a local storyteller mm -hmm. who lives in the area and is working on a book. She is the authority on that old hotel and that place, so we, we just fell in with the, the, ex the expert of our dreams, not only somebody who knows the stuff, but who's a storyteller. Yeah. Any remnants of that hotel left at all, or is it completely Not gone? really. I mean, you can, you can see the site, but it's just a, a, a patch of grass next to a river, and it's, it's gone. So you can imagine what I thought when he presented this idea of telling this great story about something that's not there. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a challenge for yeah. the videographer, right? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. But I think that particular one was you sort of had the Ken Burns thing on your mind. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, we, we've tried to do that once or twice yeah. uh, to keep up with the Ken Burns. It really does add to the story if there's really nothing left. And, and just imagine what was there, to, you know, uh, almost 200 years ago. Uh, uh, that, that makes for incredible. Storytelling uh, when you can uh, can bring that to life, and there's some wonderful photos and things, and, and like Fran Yardley had a, a plethora of just great images, and it really I learned a lot. It was great. Yeah, stories like that to me are just so poignant because uh, I mean here we are in our time, but you know our time will come and go, and there will be a day when people will reminisce on the the good old days at Mountain Lake PBS when the three of us were sitting here at the table. <laughs> That's right. Maybe somebody will, <laughs> and uh, so it's. Uh, you know, as we look back to their time and all those people are gone, it's all gone. And, and, you know, our time will be all gone one day too. So it's hard not to, you know, sort of a little tear in the corner of your eye as you tell a story like that. And I think that, that grabs people. And, and it, it must does. be satisfying in a way. As you mentioned, there are certainly experts and, and uh, authors that have written about it. But uh, to be able to share that history, again, uh, I think there's a pretty large audience that probably had never heard of Bartlett's Hotel. Yes, and, I'm sure that's true. And to help preserve that and tell that story and, and keep that alive must be, uh, must be satisfying as, a, as an author, a journalist, and a, as a storyteller. Yeah, it, it is. And it's so great to work with, uh, with uh, the, this guy sitting next to me here, too, because Josh has all, all the technical skills to take a rough idea like that. And then the finished product is just so smooth. The mix of music and narrative and pictures, there's still photographs in there and video mixed in. F the interview with Fran Yardley walking yeah. the site. And uh, it's, uh, it's easy to come up with the ideas, relatively speaking, but to, to piece all those elements together in a five to seven minute time slot and have it just run so smoothly is... is yeah, but from my really perspective, it's, it's, it's really great to have Ed as, as a writer. He, he can eloquently you know, tell these stories. Yeah. So you know, I might, I might have two, three hours of raw footage and I'll try to trim it down and get about a half an hour and I'll pass it back to Ed and then he starts to say, oh, I can tell this story. And, yeah. you know, and that's, that's, what's, that's what makes the relationship great, I think. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me, for sure. He always speaks highly of me, but <laughs> I need to turn the table on him once in a while. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, uh, again, uh, some are rather 
uh, whimsical, others are humorous, uh, the moose calling uh, was, was a great segment. But you also, like last year, uh, this past year, you also uh, looked into the Cure Cottages and, and gave us a really nice picture into the history of Saranac Lake. Right, I don't think we had too many jokes in that one because it's sort of a sad story, sure. tuberculosis and the cure, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's just a beautifully poignant story. And, and, and part of the poignancy, I guess, to me is not only that it happened then, the cure era sort of wrapped up in, in, in most, of the, you know, in most of the work in the 50s after antibiotics came along, mm -hmm. but here it is, 2015, and it's still practically all we talk about half the time in Saranac Lake. That that history is still alive. We we drive around the town. Practically every other house was a cure cottage at one time, and that we now have a, a museum devoted to the to the history of the whole cure era in Saranac Lake. And so it's it's great to to be able to to show that that what was past really isn't past. It's still alive today. And 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 for some somehow that piece does have its sort of upbeat feel to it. Um, we're talking to people that still live in these houses and they smile when they talk about the, the people that lived there before them and sometimes it was family, sometimes it was friends of family, right. but, but um, you really noticed when, you, when you're talking to the people that live there still that it, it's not really a melancholy situation. They, they, there's a lot of history there and they're, they're very, um, they find it very fascinating and interesting and, and it, it brings out smiles. Yeah, and there's a lot of stories. I mean, yes, there were unfortunately a, a lot of people that uh, that didn't survive TV, but but there were also a lot of stories that, that have carried on for generations now of, of relatives and loved ones who 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 went there and and uh, made their home. Uh, yeah, made their home, and and uh, uh, that was a big part of their lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah one of the neat uh, footprints, sort of, of the, the whole TV era, which doesn't get talked about that much, I think, is Saranac Lake, as the community Josh and I both live on the ed edge of it. It's an amazing town, full of really interesting people from all different viewpoints and things, and. Uh, I know when I meet people from other places in the country or downstate, they think this little town in the Adirondacks, it must, you know, must be just a bunch of sort of, you know, fairly, you know, a nice town, but fairly narrow, and, but it's anything but that. And I think we actually have the TB era partly to thank for that. It brought people of all different walks of life, and to some degree, people from around the world came to cure. Many of the people who right. came to, to cure or to work remained afterward. And uh, so we really are sort of a, here in the mountains, our, our little town is a hotbed of, of diversity, of political viewpoint and religion and, and all sorts of things. Yeah, and, and with the Trudeau Institute yeah. still there, a right. renowned scientist still, still working on infectious diseases and, and, and uh, other great work going on uh, at that uh, lab there, so. Yeah. We look ahead now, second season. Uh, you've already g got one segment that uh, premiered this week, uh, the uh, the first segment. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I'll let you take the wit. <laughs> uh, Ed is the master goat aficionado. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, my, uh, my wife talked me into taking our kids to a kidding this spring, which is yeah. a, a, the sort of a debutante ball for baby goats at Asgard Farm over in Osable Forks. And of course, my kids, nine and 11, at the time, immediately fell in love with uh, two little baby goats, and they are now members of our household. They are uh -huh. back home. So, uh, and 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 you know, whenever you get into a new hobby or new field of interest, you m make friends that you never e would have e even imagined that people like that existed before. So now we're we're making goat friends. P there are people out there who just live and breathe goats. Mm -hmm. And they're charismatic animals. They're charming. They love human company, probably even more than dogs do. And it's 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 a bit quirky and fun. And so uh, anyhow, yeah, Josh and I we visited some of the, the people around who are, are who are players in the world of goats, <laughs> and uh, had a lot of fun putting that one together. It might be one of our more in-depth uh, coverage. We've been to four locations, I yeah. think. Um, we've interviewed seven people, I think. Um, and yeah, there, there's kids. There's uh, uh, the lady in Jay who's... Uh, Nadine uh, McLaughlin, who's she, so eloquent uh, speaking about goats. I mean, to sit across the table from her and listen to her talk about her, and she no longer has goats. And, and yeah. the reason sort of being that she can't, that she's kind of grown. Well, they live long. She and her husband, I think, are in their 70s, and goats can live 15 years or so. And mm. so they're thinking maybe it's time to, to not get new goats. but. And she there's, a, them. there's a tear in her eye when she says that. They're their kids. Uh, they I are their kids, yeah. And uh, 
for you, uh, how, how is this taking on uh, uh, now being the proud owner of, uh, of a couple of goats? Were you prepared for this and uh, how's it? <laughs> well, it's been a huge amount of work because we didn't have a barn, so I spent, uh, I spent a month or so building a very tiny barn, which is probably too tiny, so I might be building another barn before the year is out. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. And the goats are, one of the great things about them is, uh, and Nadine made this point in the interview, is, uh, is they're so interactive. Goats just love to be around you. I went down to the goat barn one day and read them a 45-minute story out of a book. I, I, I wanted to know how long it would take <laughs> to read this story for, a, for, for another project. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they just ate it up. They just love your company. But they love it so much they don't want uh, to be out of your company, so they cry when you drive. When I drove away in the car this morning to come up here to Mountain Lake PBS, they cried as they no drove kidding. away. Just broke my heart. I almost, uh, I almost called Josh and said I'm not coming, and went back <laughs> and crawled in with the goats. So uh, yeah, they're they're amazing beings, and they they take a lot of time, just like children do. But now, as adult goats, when you say they they would eat it up, uh, literally, you would have to worry at some point about them eating up your manuscript. Or <laughs> Well, it's funny. It's interesting. They're actually fairly finicky eaters. They don't really quite live up to their reputation, but they they like to try everything. They explore the world. They're just like a, a one-year-old. They explore <laughs> the world with their mouth. So everything they see, they've got to put it in their mouth and and and, and see what it tastes like. Most things they don't actually eat, but uh, but they they will try anything. We'll so probably try and get a monitor down there, and we'll test out each Curiously Adirondack with the goats first. And see if it passes. And see if it passes. <laughs> They're your focus yeah, group. Yeah. Focus yeah. group. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then we'll hit the airwaves. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's amazing. So with all your other job titles, uh, now goat farmer. Yeah, that's uh, right. Adirondack right. guide and author. And yeah. That's fantastic. So what are some of the other segments you're working on uh, for, for this year as we head into the summer? No. Well, we have, uh, we, we've said, um, I've said all along, and I've chatted about it, that we'd like to do a music-themed one, uh, perhaps an Adirondack musician or band, That's that's uh, and sort of what it's like to be a working musician mm -hmm. in the Adirondacks. I'm a musician myself, so I know some of the trials and tribulations that go along with that. Th so there'll be a music-themed one for sure. And Josh has pointed out that the folk scene gets well covered in the Adirondacks, but the gritty rock and roll scene right. isn't. The so garage we, so band. We, so we might go find our Adirondack rock and roll uh, band or two. Yeah, the folk scene it. obviously with songs to keep, and, and uh, uh, the past couple of years, uh, a lot of uh, the, the folk singers. But Yeah, we're yeah. rich in wonderful folk singers, but as yeah. rock, Josh points out, we're, we're rich in great rock bands too. Not rich. <laughs> but, but but they're there, but but um yeah so that that'll be a fun a fun segment and then we're also going to look at um our hometown of um, Saint Armand Bloomingdale area mm -hmm. there's a lot of history there that one might lend itself more to a sort of uh, like we did at, at Bartlett's hotel mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of historians and a lot of really neat people there and Ed, Ed, that was one of Ed's ideas and I think that'll be a lot of fun um, we're also looking at going to Old Forge um, the Adirondacks are much bigger than uh, it's, it's actually hard for us to um, to cover all of it but sure, it's and, huge. And resources and things but uh, there's no shortage of, of good stories in the Adirondacks but we do plan to get down to Old Forge and uh, then that'll be a lot of fun. There's sort of two big centers of tourist tourists focusing into the six million acre Adirondack Park. One is the Tri Lakes area mm -hmm. Lake Placid, Saranac Lake, Tupper Lake w which is the area where we live but for many people, the, the sort of the epicenter of the Adirondacks is the old forge area. Yeah, so yeah. we thought it's really important to get down there and, and, and see what's going on down and there. And they have an incredible gallery down there, a view gallery, uh, that is really the center of, of the village now and just a, a, a great place uh, to, to explore all kinds of yeah. exhibits and photo uh, uh, galleries. And uh, you know. Yeah, it's a great little town. And then uh, there'll be, uh, we've looked at doing something at Paul Smith's College. You know, what we've tried to do is, is uh, each one is drastically different, as we can start to see that. And, uh, and again, last year we had said a few times, wouldn't it be fun to touch on a culinary component? We haven't done anything with food, mm -hmm. really. We have done um, some stuff with farms, but, um, and I think that was sort of a, something that you would looked at. Yeah, that would be a nice idea for us. And Paul Smith's College has that great the culinary. culinary schools in the, sure. in the region, sure. And uh, what else is on the Well, docket? Josh knows of a, of a cooper who makes uh, oh, yeah. wooden barrels in, in Wilmington, is he? Wilmington, yeah. And uh, the barrels are used for bourbon? Well, right? there's, there's an interesting story there. He's hopeful. He's hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm hoping. Um, but uh, interestingly, this guy made barrels for uh, saunas 
he made big, huge barrels, and mm -hmm. they were saunas. And mm -hmm. I think that that was, um, you know, a big part of his business. But in recent in recent years, and you, you may have heard, you know, bourbon has been has taken off as far as uh, booze is concerned, and uh, and so there's a need for barrels, so to age to age the bourbon, and so. I don't want to get too far into it because no, you make a good point. Yeah, um, oh that, my God, that's yeah. a fantastic fringe story. benefits. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So it must be great. Uh, uh, you, you the podcast goes online, and and how popular has that been? Have you really uh, heard from a lot of people that have really enjoyed the the online online segments? Well, the, the podcast is interesting because it, because it's so constant. We we can count on it every Friday. Um, it's an opportunity to always be in the out with something new and refreshing so if we have a curiously adirondack that might only come out every couple of weeks well we've still got that podcast that we can say you know so our, our names are still sort of out there so i think from that perspective it's been good ed could probably tell you a little bit more about he he has a, a vast email list and, and he sends it out to them and we use our resources as well but um, you've gotten a lot of positive feedback yes, from it. Yes, from far and wide. It's Friends in Australia and New Zealand are listening yeah. to it, so that's sort of fun. And That's actually a neat side of the, the streamed videos that we're talking about, the Curious the Adirondack series. One of the things that just, just uh, gives me a, a kick about the whole thing, uh, Josh with Diagnostics here at the station is able to, to see where people are watching mm -hmm. these. And uh, I know just, for example, the one we did last year, last season on the, on the moose calling contest, was seen in Zimbabwe, in the Maldives, out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, yeah. uh, Argentina, uh, all over Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asia, South America, North America. I mean, the the, the planet is is taking in these curious Adirondack <laughs> videos, and it's it's just amazing. Amazing, and uh, I know analysis in the industry is TV uh, uh, increasingly is moving strongly into this area of streamed stuff yeah. through the internet. Yeah. So uh, I've always thought of myself as sort of a pr technologically primitive, backwoodsy kind of a guy, and here I am working with Josh, uh, moving into the 21st century of stream video. So it's a, uh, it's a bit ironic for me professionally, and I'm, uh, it's a, I'm having a blast. Again, uh, they will now be on Mountain Lake Journal as well. Uh, we'll be seeing um, the, the segment on the goats coming up in, in within a couple of weeks. But again, uh, folks can head to mountainlake.org and watch it right now this week. Uh, the first uh, segment of the second season. Josh Clement and Ed Kens, thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having us, Tom.